Thank you. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. How are we doing? It's good. It's, good. It's, it's been a long day, right? So I'm so excited to see you here still. Yay. Um, so I'm going to go ahead. So this is the P12 panel. Uh, these are guests we've invited to share their insights. I'm going to let them introduce themselves and talk about where they're from and their experiences um, in terms of NTPA and such and the role they play. So. Joel Swanson, Normal Community High School. Um, I've had a number of uh, student teachers, and so um, I've uh, been helping with uh, EdTPA over the years and learning about it myself. Dee Hopper, I'm from Chittix Junior High. I currently teach sixth grade, and I have a student teacher who's finishing her last day today, and I've had several as well. Hi, I'm Jennifer, Ooh, Jennifer <laughs> Corbley, and I teach third grade at Pepper Ridge, and I am just finishing up with my third student teacher that has gone through the EdTPA process. I am Judy Wilson, Associate Dean of the College of Education at Augusta University, and I actually began the EdTPA initiative when it was first starting to be discussed in the state of Georgia, um, and we were kind of an early adopter in terms of trying to implement it before it became consequential. So I was the EdTPA coordinator for several years, and then now I'm sort of um, overseeing that program with someone else being the program coordinator. And I'm Latoya Dobie Holmes, the Director of Professional Learning in the Richmond County School System. I do placements for student teachers and support induction teachers. I am just asking questions during this session, so I have nothing to add. So. There we go. We're, we're just, I'm going to set the bar really low for me from the beginning. So um, we're actually, we've got about, um, did I, about four or five questions. Is that what's down there? Uh, five. Five questions. The science person is very precise. I appreciate that. You know, <laughs> um, and so uh, we're going to go through those questions, get the insights, and then open it up for open questions. Does that work for you all? OK, good. All right. We have an interactive audience. We actually have head nods and mumbles. I love it. That's fantastic. So. Uh, without further ado, here we go, and you all can decide if you want to go in order or if someone feels really passionate about a question or where you want to start. So, um, I do have to say for the three cooperating teachers, they are all from McLean County Unit 5. So for those of you who don't know, that's that's our um, actually school district, our biggest school district in the Bloomington Normal area. So, um, we're so fortunate to have them here today, especially in May. You know how hard it is to leave school as a teacher in May, right? Um, so one of the biggest conversations surrounding a TPA is the time demands of the assessment during the student teaching semester. So in light of this, have you had a student teacher who struggled with balancing the demands and what was done or could have been done to help him or her? Or, this is a big question, right? You can like, it's like that essay question where you can choose one of the two options or both. Or have you had a student teacher who seemed to balance the demands well and what do you believe were the keys to them doing so? So. I'll go ahead and start since I've got the mic. Um, so the, the answer to the first question that she asked is definitely yes. Um, I would say that most of our candidates actually struggle with the time demands. We have a few that are extremely organized, very type A, you know, really good about deadlines and kind of self-imposing those deadlines. But for most of our students, we actually have to create an infrastructure of support. And that um, includes during student teaching, we provide very specific timelines as to when those tasks are due because we've learned that if we don't do that, then they tend not to self-impose those deadlines on themselves. We also have checkpoints where our university supervisors kind of check behind them and monitor and spur them on to greatness um, when they get a little bit behind. We also invite our student teachers who were successful with Ed TPA especially in regards to time management because that is such a critical piece of all of this. Um, to come back and talk to our student teachers every semester and talk about what worked and what didn't work, what they would do differently. Um, and, and that we have found is probably the most powerful piece of what we do. Um, I would agree with a lot of what she said. I've had two student teachers through ISU and they have been well supported through the program with the exact same things that you were talking about. But my very first student teacher that I took was actually doing her program online and through the University of Arizona, or the University of Phoenix, and she had zero support. And it was my very first time, and I knew nothing about a TPA, so that one was highly stressful. 
Her program was only 12 weeks long in the classroom, and she basically had to figure everything out on her own with just the handbook. So for her, it was way more stressful than for the two that I've had through ISU that have had the supports and kind of the checkpoints, as, as you mentioned. I'm kind of on the other side of the coin toss there. I've been really blessed to have three really good uh, student teachers who went through the EdTPA, and I feel really supported through ISU here in town. They've done a great job of structuring and, um, like was mentioned earlier, setting those deadlines for those students, which really just helped kind of keep things organized and on track. So. I think the key to the question is balancing the demands Balancing the demands of ITPA and then also balancing the demands of managing a good classroom and all the things that go along with that of being a good student teacher and uh, trying to do both of those things at the same time. I have I had student teachers before ITPA. I've had them after ITPA, and the stress level has been much much higher since ITPA went in. They feel the stress of that, especially since their licensure is connected to doing well in the ITPA. And they feel it, and sometimes it does sacrifice from what they're doing in the classroom. And I, I have seen that, um, where they're spending so much time on their EdTPA ed documents that they're not as good as they possibly could have been in front of the students on a daily basis. So that's just a cooperating teacher being honest with the with the process that's there right now. Uh, okay, so. Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry, Latoya. Oh, so from a district perspective, um, it's really hard when you do have online universities, and that's been the biggest struggle for some of our student teaching, is they don't have that additional support. So it's really helpful for um, our school district that we review those uh, tutorials that AU provides so that we are abreast and aware of what those student teachers come into the classroom with come in and their expectations. All right. Um, so what are the key things that cooperating teachers need to know and under, or want to know and understand about EdTPA when they are working with a student teacher who's going through the process? So today I've heard a lot about cooperating teachers need to do zero. Cooperating teachers don't need to be involved. This should not impact the cooperating teacher. I've heard that in almost all the sessions I've been in today, but that's just not the case. We are the ones with them every day. We are the ones they are going to ask the questions to. Um, we're there, you know, and we have the experience and the exact grade level and the exact content in which they are being assessed. So we're the first ones that they come to, and that's been one of my biggest frustrations is that I didn't have any idea about it. And then they show me all these rubrics that they're being assessed on, and they're confusing, and they seem to contradict each other. And so for me, I, I do want a little bit of information about the process. And um, when somebody talked about they invite the cooperating teachers to that initial overview and overview seminar, and that would have been helpful for me at the beginning. I don't need to know every detail, but Having enough to be able to support my student teacher when she comes to me with questions would be would be beneficial. I'm so glad Jennifer shared that because that's been one of my concerns um, at the university level is that we're not communicating clearly and articulating those expectations up front. So one of the things that our university did about four years ago was created an online module. So an online professional learning module that we would send to all cooperating teachers. And they actually go through it and it leads them through task one, task two, task three. And for us, we actually, our elementary candidates have to do task four as well for the math um, piece. And we walk them through each of those tasks as far as the roles, the responsibilities, um, the expectations. And we also talk a lot about appropriate feedback because that was one of the, the things that sort of rose up as a concern early on. Our veteran teachers want to be helpful and they're not exactly sure where that line of helpfulness can be crossed. And so it was really important for us to be able to communicate those expectations and sort of the boundaries of what's acceptable support and what is not acceptable support up front so that nobody accidentally crossed those boundaries trying to be helpful. 
Um, our teachers actually take a, a quick assessment. Um, they have to make it 80% or better. And if not, then they go back through those modules. But that's a way for us to make sure that we've got some accountability in terms of we've communicated those expectations up front. And then our university supervisors actually go out and meet with every cooperating teacher and answer individual questions and that type of thing as well. I guess the, uh, the biggest question I got right away from student teachers coming in was, um, what should I do my three-day lesson on? Um, where should we put this? And, okay, I need to have it done by this day. When do you think I should do this? Well, I'm still trying to figure out what we're doing next week, let alone thinking about, hey, what are you going to be doing in the middle of March? And where does that fit in? And what class do we want to do this in? And who would it work well with? So all of those different questions came out. And I felt like I really didn't have any great answers because, to tell you the truth, I didn't really know what was going on in the whole ed TPA world. And really, once the student teacher left, I didn't know what his or her world looked like, what, what was expected of them, what was the expectation here, and as you said, rubrics, and trying to do that, and then I'm just getting feedback from them, like, I am spending hours and hours and hours typing this thing up, putting the information in, so that's just the feedback that I'm getting, you know, why are you so tired? Well, I was up until this time putting this information into the NTPA. So I think that for some of my student teachers the last couple of years, NTPA was the most common phrase they used their entire time they were there. They talked about it constantly, and it was really, uh, I guess, kind of obsessive for them at times because they had to get this done. They felt the weight of it. And as I said before, then, sometimes they didn't feel as much weight maybe what was happening in the classroom as they would have before. Because I'd had student teachers before, and their concentration was, you know, what's going on with the classroom, what's happening on a daily basis, and now it seems like they're in two worlds now, in a TPA world and in a world of what's happening now uh, in the classroom as a student teacher. So it did kind of, it definitely divided their time, no doubt about it. I would agree, just as a teacher wanting to know what, what the students are expected to know and how they're supposed to carry that out. And just, I really just, from my student teachers I get, oh, I need to be videotaped, it needs to be this, it needs, to, you get those specifics, but not about like what they're really supposed to be teaching and how they're supposed to be carrying that out. And it just would be more helpful to know exactly how I can help them and how not to overstep those boundaries. You mentioned that. I think that's hard when I'm, I'm trying to help them set up for an NTPA lesson where in a normal classroom I might be jumping in and shaking a finger at a kid or, or correcting something and I'm like, oh, am I not supposed to be, is, is she totally on her own here, even though we've been co-teaching all along, so where where do we draw the line and how do we do that fairly so that she gets assessed fairly, but that I'm still comfortable with what's happening in my classroom. That is the one thing as a cooperating teacher, ultimately you still feel totally responsible for everything that happens in that room, so it is your responsibility ultimately. So yeah, how much control do you put over to the student teacher is always a question in the entire process that's going on, and then even more so when they're, when they're doing their ed TPA in that particular process. One question I have about it too, as a junior high teacher, I teach the same class four times in a row. Joel, I don't know if you're in that situation or not, but so when they're doing the ed TPA, they are focused on that one hour, and then you kind of feel like a substitute teacher in your own classroom because you're trying to do the same thing with the rest of the kids with the other hours, but not exactly knowing exactly how they're gonna, it takes a lot, a lot of communication and coordination in that case, and it goes a little backwards there. <coughs> okay, so this actually leads into the, the next question. So what is the best way then to provide de professional development or information to cooperate teachers about ed TPA in terms of that? What would what would, what have you found to be successful or what would you prefer in terms of the information and those types of flows? At the school, at the school level, um, what really helps um, my cooperating teachers is knowing what is expected of them. Um, AU, of course, they have the orientation, but then my other universities, they sometimes provide a booklet and or a manual, which is too time consuming to really go through. Uh, teachers need a one or two pagers on a quick snapshot of what is expected of me, and then also a quick snapshot uh, guide of 
what AATPA, oh goodness, I'm messing it up, AATPA is, and I think that will help them really uh, understand and go through it. Because when you're in a classroom, you don't have time to flip through a 120 page manual on what I'm supposed to do. And one of the manuals were, I was like, 120 pages, you know, that's a turnoff for me as a teacher. Uh, that's additional work for me. Something clear cut and precise on what is expected of me. Um, one thing that I love with our partnership with AU is we have uh, professional development schools. So in our district, I think we have about 12 of them, and they have an actual coordinator from AU that is there with the student teachers and the cooperating teachers. And that has been tremendous, um, a wonderful impact for our school districts, for our cooperating teachers, and for our um, student teachers. I always hear the other cooperating teachers say, why the other universities can't offer that to us, that job embedded training and questioning for us when we need it. So I think really having clear, concise um, directions and quick guides would really help. And I can actually build on that um, because we created the online training in response to what our districts asked for. So we listened very carefully um, in terms of what they needed and what they didn't need, what was too much, what is enough. And so that's why we took sort of this 30,000 foot view what do, would a cooperating teacher absolutely need to know? We don't get down in the weeds, but we do provide an online website with additional resources in there. We also have um, a one-page document that we give to cooperating teachers, a one-page document that we give to principals, um, and that just again is a way to reinforce you know, what this means. The other thing that I meant to mention is that scores are sometimes a little bit confusing for cooperating teachers to understand and I've run into the same thing in working with principals. You know, as a principal you want to hire somebody that gets all fives. And so trying to explain sort of that paradigm shift of what that looks like um, with our principals because I remember when I passed it out and you know we kind of talked about the continuum and where they were on the continuum. You know, I could just see in the room, it kind of became a little bit competitive and that they wanted the highest score. And we really had to talk about what do those scores mean and what does that look like in practice? Um, and how can you interpret that? And so um, uh, to me, again, the communication piece is huge. Knowing your audience and being responsive to your audience's needs. So we give them more if they want more. We also give them information to, uh, to contact our ATPA coordinator if they have additional questions or or need more information about things. I think one of the, the best things that has happened in, with the student teaching program at Illinois State um, is the transfer over to a, a PDS program uh, where they are a four-year intern with me. Um, and having that first semester in order to be able to get adjusted to the classroom, procedures, things like that, Second semester then, most of the uh, student teaching candidates are pretty ready to start. They're ready to start teaching. They've got, they know where everything is, they know the people in the department. What we used to do with the PDS program uh, was, uh, and we, we used to meet um, right at the beginning of the year, all the PDS interns, uh, all the PDS cooperating teachers would meet together. And uh, that might be a really nice time uh, to be able to just go over some of the TPA materials at that point, what the expectations are. Um, and uh, I do a lot better probably with some sort of verbal training uh, where I can ask questions rather than a packet uh, that I get in the mail of, hey, this is what this is. I don't do real well with packets of information that come and, uh, you know, this is what you're supposed to have and supposed to do. So that might be a, a great way to be able to do that. Um, it might be have a training session that would be there um, and work that out with the district. And I know that we were able to do that at one point. I would agree with Joel. I think that we, we get the packets, we get the information, but we get them in the spring, the year before, and then in the fall, and it's so busy, it's such a busy time. It's just priority number 700 for me, <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not going to pull that packet out and read it likely, but I would go to a, a training if I was told that was part of my student teaching agreement, if that was part of what I was supposed to do, and I think I could benefit a lot, I think I could benefit a lot from hearing other people like these people who had some experience with it just to learn what's important. Yeah, I, I pretty much agree with everything that's been said. I think it is a fine line between, you know, requiring cooperating teachers to attend a bunch of 
trainings because that's going to turn people off from taking student teachers and offering that, you know. So um, we do have the meeting, like they mentioned, where we meet the student teachers and all of that. So that would be a great time. But requiring a bunch of meetings, I think, would be turning people off. So it's a fine line. Sometimes the nice thing also about some of those meetings was you had people who had some experience of uh, being cooperating teachers talking to people who did not have a lot of experience being cooperating teachers. And me, when I first started, that was really helpful. Um, and actually, when I actually first started, um, Elisa had, had student teachers and she helped me through that process of what that looked like and, and how to do that. And I was able to pass that on to other people. So sometimes those meetings become really good of being able to collaborate on, hey, here's been my experience. And now you can take that and say, hey, here's been my experience with EdTPA. Here's how I had a really good student teacher who handled that particular experience and be able to pass some of that information on um, to other people who might be just starting into that process. As we talk about student teachers, but also cooperating teachers learn how to do this better as well. Um, we, we learn over time how to, how to be better cooperating teachers um, so, and how to help the, the student teachers along and through that process, through experience, and passing that experience on, maybe through some sort of training, might be really valuable in doing that. What we've done with collaboration with our districts is we create for that collaboration, and not to, for it to be something required, we're going to host a mentor uh, retreat for our uh, mentors and our cooperating teachers and allow them to really collaborate. We're gonna start off with a keynote speaker and just sessions that they could build on and get the support that they need as they support uh, the teachers. Just thought of one other thing that we do um, to support our cooperating teachers and that is at our Impacting Student Learning Conference every spring that is held. Um, one thing that I don't think I shared this morning is that we actually require our induction teachers to attend that. So that one is a mandatory training and we do that in conjunction with the districts as part of their PL series um, for the year. But the other thing that we do at that conference is that we actually hold several EdTPA sessions and those are open to our candidates. They're also open to mentor teachers or anyone who just wants to know a little bit more about this um, kind of hot button performance assessment that's being discussed. And so we again have students that come um, and talk about that, but what I've realized as I'm listening to each of you is that we need to have our cooperating teachers come and do a session as well. Um, and that's what I love about this. This is a community of learners and we learn from each other and this is where I get my greatest ideas is from listening to people in the field um, and I always try to keep my ear close to the ground and not just hear what I think I want to hear, um, but to hear what's really happening. And I can tell that, that even though I think we're, we're doing a better job with communicating, there's probably still a disconnect and it would be helpful to hear the voices from the field. So thank you guys for that. Um, I, uh, I've enjoyed uh, coming today, um, and uh, it, it's taught me actually quite a bit um, about the TPA process that I really didn't know uh, before, and also uh, kind of coming from the, the classroom world, now into a little bit of a, of a different world, uh, kind of getting the perspective of what the college and university perspective is on this. It's been really good for me actually to see that, because I have my own little world in my classroom and doing my thing there and teaching my students, and I really don't have an understanding of what the university world looks like, what your expectations are, and uh, how much that really, uh, that we're all kind of struggling through this process here. You on the university side, us sometimes then on the classroom side working our way through this. So that's been really good to see, to, to come here and kind of get that different perspective. I was, I'm actually over here on my phone taking notes on what you all are saying because um, I see some supports for corporate teachers coming out of ISU. I, they've given me some homework for the summer. Like my ISU people are naughty. Like they're yes, they have. Just all right. not this weekend, right? Just not this weekend. No, no, not at all. Okay, so what is your advice to universities in terms of their role in helping NTPA implementation go smoothly? during the student teaching semester. In other words, what are the things that you as a cooperating teacher or have heard cooperating teachers rumble about? Like if the university would only do this or why aren't they doing this, et cetera, what are those things that you think need to be addressed? I really, 
can't say enough good about what ISU is already doing. It's not an ISU thing, it's an MTPA thing. And I feel like what you all are doing is supporting our student teachers. Like I said, I had a traditional online student who was not supported at all. And the difference between the two is just amazing. So I say keep it up. I, would, I feel like my student teachers have had really pretty good preparation from ISU. They, I know that you hold seminars for them and um, those seem to really be beneficial. And mine have been able to go in feeling pretty confident that they understand from their perspective what they're supposed to do. So I would just echo that. I, keep doing, I don't know what other places do, but I think we're doing pretty well here. I would say the same thing. I think the, the student teachers I've had have been very well supported uh, through the NTPA process. and. Uh, so yeah, I have no criticism there at all um, in, in making it through the process. Um, and I don't know really any way at this point to reduce the stress and the strain that EdTPA puts on them. Um, so because you, you really can't, uh, you've got to be able to explain what you did and how you did and all those stuff. And uh, um, I don't know any way to do that. As a cooperating teacher, if you give me any suggestions on how to reduce that stress on them, I'd appreciate it because uh, they, they definitely do, they definitely feel it and, and they feel the weight of it. And it is difficult as well because already when I had student teachers before, they were already feeling the weight and the strain of going from a college world now into an educational world. Those are two totally different places. Um, now all of a sudden they're feeling the weight of a lot of shift in responsibility. Uh, when you're responsible now for 25 students in that classroom and you're 21, 22 years old, that's a lot of responsibility to be put on their shoulders. And so they've got that responsibility and now they've got the responsibility of this and trying to do this to get their license. That, that's, a, that's a big shift for them. And trying to make that shift, I, I think, has been difficult. Hello? Yeah, I don't know who's in control of the timeline, but I know my student teacher was waiting last night to find out her score um, for when she tested, which today again is her last day. So that seems like a really rough timeline. Like, like what are you supposed to, she did pass, she did fine, <laughs> but, but if you don't, what do you, yeah, yeah. But like, what do you do if you don't? So there were a few student teachers in our building kind of with their fingers crossed and really hoping even so late into the game. So I don't know if there's anything the universities can do to change that timeline to help them out. That would alleviate some stress, I think, too. I was trying to think on, on my particular level what I could do going forward. And the only thing I could think of was maybe being able to, even in first semester, say, hey, here are some possibilities of things that you could teach it out. So maybe a further timeline so they could start to do some preparation beforehand so that it wasn't all happening in that, that second semester when they were trying to student teach at the same time, to try to alleviate the amount of things that they had on their plate um, at that moment. So but that was really the only thing I could think of. I don't know if you guys have thought of anything else to, to do. Yeah, I guess I was looking at this more from when you sent the question from a university perspective, like if, if a university was about to launch this, um, so is it okay if I can oh, speak to that? Okay, so so I sort of look at it more from a planning and implementation um, sort of point of view. So what would I do differently looking back? Um, to me, we did a good job strategically and intentionally trying to think through the logistics of how to roll this out. Um, we really wanted to practice several different semesters, and I'm grateful that we had the opportunity to do that because we made so many mistakes. Um, and that gave us a chance before it became consequential to go back and clean up some of those mistakes before it hurt our candidates. And so I'm really grateful that we got on board early and we weren't one of those resistant universities that said, oh, this too shall pass. Um, so we were able to protect our students in, in so many ways. They'll never realize it, but I see what could have happened if we had not been proactive in that. I would also um, really ask you to think very carefully about the TPA coordinator that you choose. Leadership matters. Leadership matters. <laughs> I don't know how to say it any, any more clearly. Um, an organization tends to reflect the leader that is leading the organization. I, I see it almost like a mirror. And so if that person is positive, if that person is optimistic, if that person is 
a problem solver, if that person takes initiative, um, then that's going to be reflected in the professors, which will also be reflected in your candidates, which will then ripple out into the schools. And so it will be a positive messaging that occurs. Um, and so I would just caution you um, to just be very selective. Really think carefully about where your institution is, where you are, what you need, um, and what kind of leader you need to put in that position. And then provide the scaffolding and support that that leader needs to be successful. Um, and th those are just some things that I was thinking of when I looked at it from a different perspective. And when you think about it, the timelines, the pacing guys, they're all important, but just like with anything else, we need to make sure that we're monitoring it to see where they are and not waiting to the very last minute and saying, are you finished? You know, everything's supposed to be due tomorrow, but strategically pacing them and monitoring it throughout the process. All right, so this is our last official question, then we'll open it up for questions. So. Um, there's much conversation about the connections between EdTPA and professional teacher evaluations and EdTPA kind of being the beginning of that professional development continuum. What are your thoughts or insights on this? How can universities and P12 partners capitalize on this connection? Maybe the world's longest question. I'm really sorry. <laughs> I think what's key is, I know when we did our presentation, showing teachers how the two are linked. Again, in Georgia, we do a very good alignment when our teachers are going through their student teaching. Uh, previously, I worked at the Georgia Department of Education where the teacher and leader effective keys rolled out at. And many of our colleges and universities had their uh, student teachers uh, in in the platform, so as student teachers, they were logging into the platform that they would be logging into when they officially become teachers. So it seemed like a seamless uh, process. What we have to keep in mind is that through both processes, we are preparing teachers to enhance their practice to include and to improve student achievement. So we need to always uh, stay focused on the student achievement piece and enhancing those teachers' professional practices. I think this builds on what we were just talking about this morning in terms of partnerships and leveraging those partnerships as potential capital. Um, and that, that to me is a really positive thing. Um, what we've done as an organization is, is really listen, listen to our partners. So, we try to get them to the table as often as we can, um, but, but it really is more just listening to where they are, what they're doing, what their needs are, and then trying to find those, what I call natural connections, the low hanging fruit, the place where we could go together that maybe we couldn't go alone, the place where we can win and they can win. And so looking for those opportunities, and I'll tell you that that's a, a difficult thing to do, um, but once you get in the pattern of it, it becomes very natural. And so for our organization, that has become a part of our culture. That's a part of who we are and what we do. So to us, there's a very natural, seamless connection between what we're doing with a TPA and showing that our teachers know how to teach, they know what to teach, and they know how to assess and how to close that, that loop of, of good teaching. And then that, there, that creates that bridge that we talked about into professional practice. I've been teaching for a while now, and so I started, when I started and was received my first evaluations, it was a principal coming in and saying, great job, good lesson, and that, and I got my little rating, and I moved on, and that was it. So now my evaluations are way different, so I, I do think that I'm glad I don't have to go through everything they do as student teachers with that ed TPA, um, but it really does teach them how to reflect and how to improve, and that's exactly what we have to do on our evaluation. So I feel like that's a, a, a great connection there. Um, that is the ultimate goal of the evaluation tool is to make teachers better um, and to uh, um, look at areas that we personally can say, hey, I know this is a, a weak spot for me, and I can identify that myself. This is an area where I need improvement. 
And that's the goal of the evaluation tool, and that's what uh, that's where we need to get at TPA, where the, the student teacher is looking at it the same way. This is a tool for me here to become a better teacher, not just, hey, here's my score, and this is the score I need, and this is the score I have to get in order to be able to get my license, but it's become a tool that, hey, this is what's going to make me a better teacher and improve my skills for my profession. I would completely agree with everything they've said. When my student teachers are feeling stressed and overwhelmed about the EdTPA, that's what I'm constantly reminding them, that this is, if you can pass EdTPA, you'll be fine when you get evaluated in the field because honestly, like sometimes I think they're held to a higher expectation than even what we are because it's so time consuming and it's one shot. You know, my evaluation is over a two year period and I have all this time to prove the evidence that I'm you know, doing a great job and they have to prove it in three lessons. So I just remind them that this is where you're going once you have a job and if you can do this, you can, you can do the evaluation. I think they also spend a lot of time stressing over have I uploaded the right thing, have I put the right document in, have I written this the right way, um, is this what they want to know, so they stress about that a lot um, there. And you know, it is somewhat the same, at some point, is this what the principal wants to see, is this the thing, so there is some of the same thing there, um, but to try to get away from that as much as possible, uh, where it's not so much a format issue, it's a, it's a actual uh, job observation of how they actually perform in the classroom. All right, so now you get to make me run around like crazy, and do we have questions from the audience? All right. I escaped the cord, so we're doing good. I'm now in the clear. Hey, well, I'm the parents from the University of Iowa. So do you think the ITPA is worth it? <laughs> I stole your mic, so you'll have to use I like controversial, <laughs> I get that, I understand the political world um, that we live in. Um, we resisted at TPA in the beginning too, you know, anytime you hear that a mandate is coming, I think we as educators always question why, and we question is this in the best interest of our P12 students and our candidates. I think we also look at enrollment, we look at economic things, you know, kind of that trickle down effect. What are going to be the unintended consequences of a new assessment like this? Um, and I, as an educator, I've been an educator for 28 years, and I was one of the ones that said, I want to look at this very carefully, analytically, strategically, um, to see if this is in the best interest of, of our organization, our state, and ultimately, we've seen it you know, go nationally. Um, and, and I will tell you that I've spent a tremendous amount of time, I would use the term wrestling with the document, um, trying to understand it, trying to understand the rationales behind things. Um, I've been involved in NTPA for about six years, and I can honestly say without question, it is one of the best things that has happened to our organization. It has allowed us to have conversations that we would have never had before. It has enabled us to make some curricular decisions that I knew were in the best interest of our candidates, but we resisted making them because it was so much work and there were political ramifications for making those decisions. Um, so for us, it has been a springboard for proactive improvement, and I can say that without question. Have there been times when I wanted to throw it out the window? Yes. Yeah. Have there been times when I wanted to just say, can't you just take my word for it? I'm watching her every day, you know? But at the end of the day, like, it's holding her to a much higher expectation than I probably ever would have as a cooperating teacher because my natural role is to be caring and supporting and all of those things that I'm not going to be there when she goes out into the real world. So at the end of the day, I would say, yes, it's worth it. Yeah, I would, I would totally agree. I think you talk so much with those student teachers and every lesson they teach, you're having you talk about this, you talk about that, you talk about all those things. So I think those conversations happen anyway, but maybe they're just taking it from a different perspective and, and you do kind of get to know that person so well that sometimes I think you overlook things or things that might be weaknesses for you, you might not pick up on. I think it helps in that way too. I think that uh, overall in the student teaching experience, um, the most important 
thing that they're going to get out of that is probably going to be the insights that they get from the cooperating teacher. Um, that's probably going to be the, the best building block that they have that's going to be going forward. The only concern that I have about Ed TPA is does the amount of time they're spending on the Ed, P Ed TPA take away from their performance as a student teacher? That's the biggest concern that I have. And does that extra stress then also take away from the uh, performance and the focus they have on the classroom that's in front of them on a daily basis? So that's, that's my biggest concern that I've got about the Ed TPA. And, and I concur with the panel, yes, it is worth it. It builds just like um, effective evaluation systems overall purpose is to enhance teacher efficacy. And if, uh, we're doing it with fidelity, of course, with everything. Um, we're gonna have some issues, but if we work hard and collaborate and overcome them, I think at the end of the day, the overall purpose of it is beneficial. I'm Karen Putra from Illinois State University, so I get the joy of working with her, which is <laughs> wonderful because she gets lots of emails from me all the time. Uh, this is kind of for the CTs a little bit. Um, it was mentioned today in a couple other things I was at that some universities are holding writing days, at TPA writing days, where the students are excused from student teaching for the day and come to campus and spend the day working on their TPA TP together as a group. I'm just wondering from your perspective, do you think that would be something beneficial for the student teachers? And certainly you all from Georgia can answer that as well. Um, for relieving some of the stress or maybe just getting some really productive hours in that they don't have to worry about teaching for that day. The, the student teacher I had this semester and, and previously I think that was really helpful on the Ed TPA side. Um, it was a, a little difficult on the classroom side at times um, when you're trying to establish authority and trying to be the authority figure in the classroom. Being there every day makes a huge difference um, in uh, me being able to kind of step away and then step in. It was a little difficult at times for them to step in, now I'm back, now I'm gone, now I'm back. And that, uh, that did create a little bit of a hole there at times uh, when that happened. Because uh, they were also trying to mix in um, times where they're doing that, they're out for some other things, and then also uh, I know that sometimes they're out for like job interviews, and those are important things for them to be able to leave. So there were some weeks where I was in, out, in, out, and it certainly did break down the, the flow and the authority that, that they were able to establish. So that, that did make things a little bit more difficult for me. My student teachers have been able to take time, like during their TPA week, during their three lessons, then they have time. But they do it at, I don't know if that's true everywhere, we said they do that at school. Yeah, that depends on um, our program. So, so your, the TCH programs, they give them writing time during the week that they're Im implementing at TPA. Okay. To take time, and that's their time. Okay, so ours have had that time at the middle level. They have the time that they're, they're required to come to school and use the time there, so they find a conference room or the library or wherever they can go. And I've had it, I've had it both ways. I've had some that were very productive, and I've had some that they're kind of sitting by themselves and they're checking their email or their Facebook, and they're not so. And I think that's probably an individual. Well, that's what I think, but they actually come together. Not yeah, and so I, we, I've never had a student teacher who's had that. I know that they do talk about their TPA experiences and they compare. Um, but we haven't, I haven't had a student teacher who's had that. I, I don't think they would be interested in having it. I think they'd like it. I don't know how productive it would be. Yeah, I would see it. The elementary looks exactly like that. They teach their lesson, they go to a conference room and work on their writing. And um, again, it's personal preference. Some of them go in there and, you know, knock it out. And others say, I gotta do this at home, you know, in my pajamas, with my whatever. And so. <laughs> And so, um, I don't know, I've, we, we had two student teachers that went into the conference room together, and I don't know if that was more of a benefit or more of a distraction, I, I really don't know. 
I've never heard of that model before, so that's interesting. Um, our candidates actually, because we don't want them to lose the momentum, they continue staying in their placement and they continue being the teacher of record while they're doing it TPA. Um, so they are actually working on it at home at night um, and on weekends. But we do bring them back to campus right before each task is due. So a few days before it's due, we give them about a four hour block, usually in the afternoon. They come to campus, we have university supervisors that are in the room with them, we call it a boot camp. Um, and, and they just work on writing. Now the interesting thing to me is when I go in that room, there are people like me who like to work alone. Um, and so we provided them a space where it's quiet and there's no noise, no distraction, no talking. Um, but then there are others that are probably more like Elisa who just, you know, the life of the party in gregarious and they're all, you know, collaborating and talking. And, um, and so they find, they kind of feed their soul there in that environment. So we give them a choice. You can either work alone or you can kind of collaborate with a partner, not reading each other's material. I'm not talking about that kind of thing and editing or anything like that. Um, but just, you know, being there to support each other, to, to talk through the questions and, and those types of things. Um, but, but it does, we've wrestled with whether to take them out at all. Uh, we have gotten positive feedback from our candidates that it is helpful to come to campus and to have our ATPA coordinator and our content experts there to answer questions. And that's what it is. Um, it's sort of a, another scaffolding, another layer of support. We have time for one more question. I do have to say, we have one program at ISU that does a split placement, and they actually take a week off in between placements to finish their ed TPA. So they, they have found that losing a week of student teaching was worth it because their kids aren't as distracted by ed TPA during the semester then because they know they have one week to write, finish, and be done. So um, they have found that they have a very high success rate in that program. So. Otherwise, Will's, Will's going to take it. He's taking the mic. I got a lot of questions here. Uh, so the other question I have is, um, so the language we found when we implemented this year, this is the first year that is more consequential in Iowa. And so we found that one of the challenges that our cooperating teachers had was simply how the language of the ATPA is different than some of the language that they use to, to do their work, to do their tasks. Um, in what ways were you supported in adopting the language of via TPA? You know, I'm talking about central focus, language function, syntax, discourse, yada, yada, yada. Were you supported? Were you supported? And would that have been key words? No, I would say that that's one of the big struggles when I talk about looking at the rubrics and going, I don't even know what this means. Yeah, she'll, I say, that's what you she'll say, well, I mean, just in general, there's so many things that, like you said, are just different and I did not feel supported. I mean, I would refer her back to her university supervisor because I would say, I don't know what that means. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, what you just said. Yeah, I'm going to I think this past year, for the most part, a lot of times with the TPA, um, I would I would tell I would tell her, hey, I will uh, answer questions about what's going on in the classroom and, and this and that, but you're going to have to handle the TPA stuff because yeah, I just don't have that background and understanding what's going on. I can help you here, but I just can't help you there. So um, she was a little bit on an island with that with that stuff. It's probably not big packet.
do you, uh, do you feel like your students feel like a TPA is worthwhile? Um, because the feedback that I get from the people that, that I deal with is they kind of give the idea that that some things are worthwhile but others aren't and maybe just the just the vast scope of what needs to be done is what what is not is the part that they feel like they're just spinning their wheels with it. Yeah, I think that the, the feedback that I because I try to do access surveys in the app, so I teach the elementary education students to teach uh, summer. And the access survey data that I have from them is interesting. It's very clear. The ones who pass at the very end will say way more positive things, obviously, <laughs> than the ones who struggle with it and have had to do some retakes. Um, so, so then that makes me think, like, okay, let's like, like, critically think about that data, right? Because that that's not the like, true like valid information as far as I'm concerned. They're just judging it off of whether the, whether the, whether or not they pass. Yeah, and I guess the, the the ultimate data will be down the line when you can match up ed TPA success with teacher success, and that's the big question going forward: is will those two things correlate um, in in the long run? All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you to our panel for answering tough questions and appreciate it. And um, that wraps it up for us. There'll be presenters coming in. If you have follow-up questions, those who could stay will be coming in. But thank you so much.